Thank you for being here. My name is Marcia Eli. I am really delighted to greet you on behalf of the Brooklyn Public Library, our arts and culture team, BPL Presents, and this place, the Center for Brooklyn History. Joe Sexton's recent book, The Lost Sons of Omaha, unpacks two linked tragic deaths stemming from the 2020 George Floyd protests. And in doing so, also unpack some of the most pressing issues facing America today. Our racial mistrust and division, our dire need for gun control, and the toxic power of fake news. The book provokes deep reflection. It's really a powerful wake-up call and a heartbreaking story. We're honored to have Joe with us tonight, along with his esteemed conversation partner, Errol Lewis, to talk about the book and the issues. Before I introduce them, more formally, um, I want to share that towards the end of their conversation, you will all have a chance to ask questions. Uh, and I want to make sure you saw the Lost Sons of Omaha at the CBH shop. As you came in following the program, Joe will be very happy to sign books and continue the conversation informally. Now it is my honor to tell you a little bit more about these two extraordinary journalists and invite them to come on up. Joe Sexton is a former senior editor at ProPublica who also spent 25 years as a reporter and editor at the New York Times. While serving as Metropolitan Editor of the Times, his staff won two Pulitzer Prizes, including the award for breaking news for its coverage of Governor Elliot Spitzer's downfall. Errol Lewis is the political anchor of New York One News, where he hosts Inside City Hall, the nightly primetime show about New York City politics, and also hosts the weekly podcast, You Decide with Errol Lewis. Errol has moderated dozens of high-profile debates for, you name it, mayor, governor, city and state comptroller, U.S. Senate, everybody. He's also a political analyst for CNN and an adjunct professor of urban reporting at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. I could say a lot more about both of these men and their accomplishments, but I think best to, 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 to hear their conversation. So please help me welcome them to the stage. Thank you, Marcia, and um, welcome to everybody. This is a, a great chance to um, hear about an extraordinary book and an important story, um, and to hear from an important and interesting author uh, who we, we, are, we, we did a little bit of reminiscing here because we met a few blocks from here uh, about a billion years ago in the mid 80s when a newspaper called The City Sun was being launched. And he was the sports editor. He talks about the, the sports writer. He talks a little bit about this in the book. And I was, I'm not even sure what my job was supposed to be. I did a little bit of everything. We all did a little bit of everything. Um, it was a, a newspaper with a, a very pronounced political bent because the publisher and founder of the paper was active here in Brooklyn politics. And so we kind of cut our teeth together and it was, a, a fun and extraordinary time, and a, a third member of that that small group, uh, Gordon Balcom, is here taking pictures as usual. But uh, 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 this this uh, this book, I guess the the easiest way to describe uh, the 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 starting point of it or the easiest way to connect with it for we who were in Brooklyn, we know that there were lots of demonstrations going on in the summer of 2020, a whole lot. Uh, the pandemic, of course, was happening, but there was a, kind of a nationwide uh, awakening on issues of racial justice, especially involving um, police and police violence. And this not only happened here in Brooklyn, where there were many, 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 many marches not far from here on Flatbush Avenue, um, but also in Omaha, Nebraska. And it is the scene of this book, and it was, in fact, the scene of a tragedy where uh, there were uh, complex but familiar, eerily familiar circumstances under which a black man was killed by a white man um, who believed he was 
uh, acting in self-defense and defending his property against someone who had bad intentions. And it folded right into that larger narrative of the marches that were going on when the incident took place. And so the next logical thing, of course, is that a reporter from New York would come in and uh, so sort the whole thing out. As And actually, it is an important part of the story is that uh, you managed to achieve um, trust among warring local tribes in what is, by New York standards, a small town, Omaha, um, and r really probed a lot of issues that were not just local, but national in scope. So uh, congratulations on that, for sure. Um, and I, I, I guess I wanted to know if, if you could start by reading some parts of, of the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's lyrically, it's beautifully written, and I'm not even sure which part you might choose. I, I've got my own favorite s s spots, but, but um, how, how, how do we get here, and, and what are we going to hear from you? Well, I'm going to stay in memory lane for a second. Um, so we started at the City Sun uh, in 1984. Um, and this was then, I believe, although subject to correction, the Brooklyn Historical Society. Um, yeah. And so both then uh, and then when 10 years later, I was back in this neighborhood uh, with the greatest title I, I have ever held, which is Brooklyn Bureau Chief for the New York Times. Um, who knew they even had one? Uh, yeah. um, but, and again, I was in here doing research um and I, I i was doing a little rummaging in my home today uh and i came oh across the, the, the very first edition the yellow of the city sun um carrying the byline errol t lewis um death of a generation is the headline um almost as unhappy a story as mine um <laughs> the uh and you know, we, we were many things back in the day, but we did have a degree of self-regard. Um, the City Sun, because the, the, on, the on the message here, speaking truth to power. Yes. Um, so we were, we were quite full of ourselves. Um, <laughs> anyway, it, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to be with Errol. Um, I was giving him grief because he's now dropped the T from his bylines now. They're not Errol T. Lewis. Um, but um, I, so, well, one thing I just would remark on is I had never, I had spent, you know, many parts of my life crisscrossing the country um, as a feckless college student and then as a sports writer for the New York Times. And, um, and I've been to almost every state. Prior to doing this book, I had never stepped foot in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, but among the many things I've learned, it's a, it's a pretty neat town with its own um, complicated and fascinating history, uh, not least of which is there were any number of black publications in Omaha, like three, four, five, either weekly or daily newspapers in Omaha, Nebraska. And the whole rationale between for us to start the City Sun was that in New York City there had been an absence and a lack of history of a black press. Um, so that was an arresting and sort of humbling uh, moment. The Omaha Star is still being published there. Um, anyway, so how, how did I come to write this book? Uh, the truth is, I, I never much wanted to write a book. Um, the, uh, if you're a reporter and editor at the New York Times for a quarter century and another decade at ProPublica, you find yourself involved with any number of big and interesting stories and there are opportunities to write books about them. Um, I had agents approach me to write a book. I had publishers say I should. Um, but the plain truth is the idea of it scared the shit out of me, um, terrified me. I never thought I had either the talent or the discipline to do it. Um, so how, now that I apparently have, how did that happen? So I will, two events really shaped how this book came to be. The first is in the summer of 2020, early summer of 2020, uh, my wife and I were back in Brooklyn. We had fled the pandemic and moved to Vermont. We had to come down and throw a bunch of stuff out of our home. And it was a Thursday afternoon in July and I got a call 
uh, from the editor in chief at ProPublica. And um, I tell the story with a great smile. Um, he said, well, Joe, we, we don't have anything to publish on Tuesday. Um, and uh, there's a story of a racial killing in Omaha and it looks like a white supremacist killed a young black kid and got away with murder. Um, could you turn that around for Tuesday? <laughs> and I, I tell it with a smile because whether you know, you're at the City Sun or you're at the New York Times where you have a newsroom of six people or you have a newsroom of 1,400 people, daily newspapering is always done by desperation, right? Do, do we have enough stuff for tomorrow's paper? Um, you know, I got to fill this publishing hole on Tuesday. Really? Anyway, it took me about five seconds of Googling to realize I wasn't turning any story around for Tuesday. Um, but there were elements of what I was able to look into that got my attention. I thought it was interesting and, and complicated and potentially, um, you know, telling in some way. And so I followed the events over the ensuing weeks and months. Um, and I eventually put together what I thought was a pretty good kind of magazine length story about what had taken place in Omaha. Um, and I left ProPublica and at the tender age of 61, I was like, well, I'm a freelancer now. Maybe I should get a fucking agent. That would be a good idea at 61. Um, so I did and, and I showed him the magazine piece that I was excited about and, and he said, well, maybe you should do it as a book. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to do a book. Um, but he convinced me and we turned the magazine piece into a proposal and um, I was then reunited with a fabulous reporter from the New York Times who had gone on to do some really extraordinary, intrepid, brave reporting about all the mayhem and mischief that goes on on the world's oceans. And he had encouraged me to join him and to go on a reporting trip to North Africa. Uh, so the agent was like, well, Joe, do you want me to send the book proposal out before you go to Libya or when you get back? And I was like, ah, fuck it, go, send it out now. Um, and so he did, and uh, Ian and I and two others set off for Libya. Um, we were there about a week, and I got an email. Uh, we were staying at a hotel in Tripoli. I got an email from my agent saying, an editor at Knopf would like to talk about the book proposal. Um, and he was like, do you have Wi-Fi there? I was like, yeah, I'm responding to your email. Um, the, uh, and I said, well, you know, he said, can you do a Zoom call on Monday? Um, and I said, sure, um, sounds great. I mean, uh, Alfred Knopf, you know, um, I barely know how to pronounce it, but I know it's a major American publishing house. Um, and we, we were set for 10 a.m. on Monday. And at 7 p.m. on Sunday, uh, the four members of our reporting team in Tripoli were abducted um, at gunpoint. Um, we ultimately spent six days uh, in captivity. Uh, it was the whole ugly playbook of such things, blindfolds and AK-47s and forced confessions and proof of life videos. Anyway, through the grace of God, the US State Department and our families, we were all released and made it home safely. Um, and um, to this day, I'm always a little bit amused by the idea that both my newly found agent and the editor from Knopf showed up on the Zoom call on that Monday at 10. And they must have been like, well, what the fuck is with this guy? Like, he's never even written a book, and now he can't even show up. Um, uh, you know, like, what a prima donna. Whatever. Anyway, I got back, I called my agent, and I said, um, you know, well, this is what happened. And he said, well, that's a pretty good excuse. Um, he said, but there are seven major American publishing houses who want to talk to you about the proposal. And I really believe the only reason I ever said yes to that was that I was in some kind of altered state. Um, because, I, like I said, I was truly terrified of the prospect of trying to write a book. You know, as journalists or whatever, we, we always want more words, right? I can't possibly write this story in anything under 1,500 words, whatever. And then somebody tells you, well, you got to turn in 100,000 in a year. And I'm like, uh, how am I ever going to get there? Um, 100,000 words. Um, but in a sort of altered state, uh, uh, I said yes. Um, 
And what I'd like to do is to um, read what I, I've tried to distill it. I can't possibly presume people here have had the chance to read the book, uh, nor whether they ever will. Uh, I hope you do. Um, but um, so I've sort of distilled it to um, its essence. It takes me about 12 minutes to do. And with your permission, I'll do it. Can you hear me okay on this mic? Is that fine? By nightfall on May 30th, 2020, Jake Gardner was inside his nightclub in Omaha's Old Market District. He had two pistols and a shotgun. One of his regular bartenders eventually joined him. A second night of Black Lives Matter protests in the streets of Omaha had turned ugly, and the crowds were descending on the city's downtown. Bricks and Molotov cocktails were being heaved at buildings and at police, and officers in riot gear had responded with tear gas. Gardner was a white, 38-year-old product of Omaha schools who had won a presidential medal as part of one of the very first US Marine Corps units to evade Iraq in 2003. Gardner had returned to Omaha and made a success of himself running one of the city's most popular downtown bars. That bar, called The Hive, had been shuttered for weeks amid the initial outbreak of the pandemic, and Gardner had been bleeding losses. With a reopening imminent, he had stocked his bar full of liquor, what one partner said represented some $90,000 in prospective gross income. The two nights of angry protests in Omaha had been triggered by George Floyd's death at the hands of a police officer in Minneapolis and young people had filled Omaha's streets. James Skurlock, 22, was one of them. Named for his father, Skurlock was one of more than two dozen siblings, including stepbrothers and stepsisters, who spent all or parts of their upbringing in North Omaha, the black and mostly poor corner of the city. Skurlock had endured bouts of homelessness as a child and was put behind bars at 16, denied the chance at any kind of diversion program that might have offered mental health treatment or education instead of jail time. He had issues then with America's criminal justice system. Skurlock and a friend that night had trashed a business office down the block from Gardner's bar and had later helped smash the windows to Gardner's establishment and heave garbage and debris inside. Gardner and his bartender had hid out behind a wall inside the bar Gardner was prepared to use his guns if it came to that, but he wound up calling 911 for help. Gardner, I've got some people breaking in all the windows right now. It's 1207 Harney Street. Dispatcher, 1207 Harney, are you on scene there or are you viewing this from a camera? I'm inside the window being broken right now. Is that the hive? Yeah, correct. How many people? More than 10? Yeah, for sure. There's like a whole mob of them. I have no idea. They're throwing things through the windows. I just wanted to call in and make sure that I was on the record. Dispatcher, okay, anybody inside injured? Need a rescue squad? No, we're good. We're kind of pulled back from the windows. I'm pretty sure they used a gun, so we pulled back pretty far, just so that nobody got injured. And then we parked behind a brick wall. Okay, Gardner, pretty crazy. Dispatcher, what's your name, please? My name is Jacob Gardner. I'm the owner of this place. Shortly before 11 p.m., there was a lull in the tumult, and Gardner, the bartender, and Gardner's father, who had just arrived, stood outside the bar. When the father saw a business next door being vandalized anew, he cursed and pushed a white protester who was filming the scene. Then, Skurlock's friend leveled the 69-year-old Jake Gardner, a pistol in his waistband, went to see who had flattened his father. Skurlock then raced across the street and along with others got in front of Gardner. Black lives matter, someone said. I agree, Gardner said. He told those in front of him that if they hadn't knocked his father to the ground, they should move on. Skurlock and others advanced on Gardner. Gardner, backing up toward the front of his bar, flashed the gun in his pants, then held it at his side, then put it back. 
all the while telling people to stay the fuck away from him. Suddenly, Gardner was jumped from behind by a young woman and taken to the ground. He fired two shots and tried to get to his feet. Skurlock then jumped on his back and the two struggled for the gun. Gardner pleaded with Skurlock to get off him. He then got the gun in his left hand and fired a single bullet over his shoulder. Shot in the neck, Skurlock was pronounced dead shortly afterward. Across 40 years as a newspaper man, I'd always been drawn to heartbreak. The Catholic bishop who died of AIDS in secret and in shame, the Brooklyn girl on her roller skates killed by a stray bullet. I'd found that in diving into those stories of devastating loss, I almost always discovered people of remarkable grace, moments of acceptance and forgiveness. What happened in Omaha was, of course, far more complicated than a child accidentally slain in the street. Skurlock's death occurred as the country had reached a breaking point. In 2020, whether it was the men who chased Ahmad Arbery through their neighborhood before one of them shot him at close range, or a police officer slowly asphyxiating George Floyd in front of onlookers in Minneapolis, black men dying at the hands of white men was a raw and explosive issue in America. Yet the events in Omaha seemed to me to amount to a certain kind of tragedy and an important one in an angry and divided nation. Not the straightforward tragedy of great loss resulting from bad luck, not the Shakespearean variety involving the noble person with a tragic flaw. Rather, the sort in which two characters, both with stakes in their community, maybe one black and the other white, take matters into their own hands and produce an awful outcome, a tragic result for which there are no outright villains, a horror in which the specifics of the individuals and their fateful circumstances aren't swept up by larger agendas or long-standing grievances, however real and true. Maybe Gardner shouldn't have been out there with a gun that night. Maybe he should have grabbed his father and gotten away from everyone as quickly as he could. But maybe he had, in several critical seconds, legitimately feared for his life. Maybe Skurlock should not have been vandalizing businesses, but maybe he, in the same critical seconds, legitimately wanted to prevent more gunfire and had jumped on the man with the weapon. Such tragedies, it seemed to me, could offer the families and communities that suffered grievous pain the chance to heal together. And I, I knew in my heart, or thought I did, they had happened not all that long ago in America. Here's one I have carried with me. Shortly after 10 p.m. on May 28, 2009, Omar Edwards, a black rookie officer with the New York Police Department, had just finished up his shift. Edwards, 25, was the father of two young boys, and as he left the 25th precinct in Harlem, he texted his wife that he was eager to get home. He'd be off for the next couple of days. Edwards, upon leaving the station house, was startled to see someone trying to break into his car in the street. A scuffle followed, and when the thief ran off, Edwards pulled his off-duty weapon and gave chase. Just then, Andrew Dunton, 30, was in the front passenger seat of an unmarked car along with two other members of the 25th Precinct's anti-crime unit, charged in part with getting guns off the city's streets. A raft of felony arrests had led to Dunton's promotion into the unit, but in his nearly five years on the job, he'd never had to fire his weapon. Dunton stumbled for a second as he rushed to get out of his vehicle, quick to try and confront a man with a gun in his hand racing through the street. Dunton, from behind the car's open door, managed to shout, police, drop the gun. Edwards' investigators were later determined, turned toward Dunton, made eye contact, pointed his gun, and according to one witness, started to say what sounded like a single word, police. Dunton fired six bullets. Emergency personnel discovered Edwards was an officer when they cut open his clothes to see he was wearing a police academy t-shirt. His badge was found in his front pants pocket. 
It was a shattering story, and as Metropolitan Editor at the New York Times, I, I poured resources at covering it. What has stayed with me is what happened next. New York, despite its vast and lacerating racial history, did not explode in protest. Robert Morgan thought the legendary white Manhattan district attorney convened a grand jury, and Dutton was among some 20 people who testified before it. The grand jury found no cause to prosecute Dutton. At the funeral for Omar Edwards, hundreds of officers, black, white, Asian, Latino, male, female, lined the streets of Brooklyn. Inside Our Lady of Victory Roman Catholic Church, then Mayor Michael Bloomberg announced Edwards would be posthumously promoted to the rank of detective, improving the benefits his widow would receive. The church's pastor, when he rose to eulogize Edwards, included a call to pray for Dunton. He too needs compassion, the pastor said. Should Edwards, not even out of his probationary period as an officer, have taken off after a petty thief with his gun drawn? Likely not. Was Dunton's action subconsciously colored in some way by implicit bias? A black man with a gun couldn't be anything but a threat? Likely, yes. But there were no villains. More training might help things. Hate wouldn't. With no fingers to point, it seemed, people had found a way to join hands. The grief was shared and profound. Years before he became mayor of New York, Eric Adams, a former cop, captured the heartbreak. This is the most Shakespearean aspect of policing, he said. Your greatest fear is to be shot and slain on duty, and that's only matched by your fear of shooting another officer. If you speak with nine out of 10 officers of color, they will tell you that when they hear sirens, in their head they are thinking, I hope these cops know that I'm one of the good guys. In that moment a decade ago, people in their shared grief had been able to see each other, to recognize each other. Their dual devastation had erased the many barriers life had put between them. The story of James Scurlock's death in Omaha would not be one of those stories. Almost instantly, false or unproven information about the deadly encounter spread online. People posted that Gardner had targeted Scurlock and shot him twice from behind. Gardner and his father had used racial slurs, people said. Then, the two men were turned into ugly caricatures. A handful of old Yelp reviews alleging Gardner's bar had a racist door policy were dug up. He was a Trump supporter and thus a fascist. Skurlock was initially lionized online. He'd gone to protest white violence and paid with his life. But then video emerged of him vandalizing the business down the block from Gardner's bar and his prior criminal record surfaced online and far right chat rooms lampooned Skurlock as a thug who got what he deserved. Vigilantism gained a menacing momentum as Gardner's telephone number and address were posted on the internet. If troubling, it felt in 2020 dispiritingly predictable too. The country's divides, political, racial, cultural, had come to feel not just partisan, but sectarian. We didn't just disagree with each other about an election, a debate, a news story. We demonized those on the other side. So there, in Omaha, America was acting true to form insisting on a culprit in every tragedy, digging for clues and motives and easy answers to try to push an agenda rather than accept facts, even misrepresenting or inventing details in the absence of a clear good versus evil narrative. The vigilantes on social media and the partisans in the culture wars need even lust for pure villains. Pressure can consequently be brought to bear to bend justice one way or another. And so the people of Omaha found themselves with a fatal tragedy that quickly turned into something else. Competing campaigns of misinformation or oversimplification, which became mean 
and in the end, dangerous too. It all seemed to leave precious little room to contemplate what happened that May night in Omaha as a tragedy without culprits. The investigation of Gardner's killing of Skurlock fell to the white county attorney, Don Klein. Klein was a Democrat with some genuine progressive credentials. After an investigation, his office clue concluded that Gardner hadn't gone out looking to shoot Skurlock. Witnesses, including Skurlock's friend, said they did not hear Gardner use racial slurs. Gardner may not have had any idea if Skurlock was white or black. Skurlock's death was crushing, Klein determined, but it wasn't a crime. Skurlock's sprawling family was a mixed but distinctive clan, talented, hardworking, wayward, committed, loyal. His older brother had done years in prison. Another brother served in the military and became an accomplished artist. A few siblings were activists with the Revolutionary Action Party in North Omaha. They were torn apart by Skurlock's death. In the end, though, Skurlock's father wasn't interested in establishing Gardner as a racist. He just wanted a better investigation into how his son had died. Witnesses had complained that police officers had been uninterested in hearing their accounts. Hadn't bringing a gun into the chaotic streets been reckless, maybe even criminally so? His father made the point that if the races of the two men were reversed, there's no way in hell Skurlock would not have been charged. White people get the benefit of the doubt. Black people don't. That's criminal justice in America, they argued. It was a local lawyer, though, who made what amounted to a citizen's case against Gardner, one that helped shape the inflammatory narrative of Gardner's character and motivations. The lawyer, Ryan Wilkins, a white man born and raised in Omaha, had confessed to friends that he had wanted to be better at calling out racism. And so for weeks that summer, he produced a series of posts on Medium and shared them through his Facebook account, making a variety of claims. Gardner's father had been indoctrinated into white supremacy while behind bars in Texas for drug running. Gardner himself had a swastika tattoo. White supremacist symbology could be found in Gardner's bar's logo. I looked up prison records and there was nothing about the older Gardner having spent time locked up in Texas. Jake Gardner's medical records contained no references to a swastika tattoo. And any defamation league expert on white supremacy debunked the idea that Gardner's bar held secret white supremacist codes. Yet the lawyer's posts went viral and politicians joined in. Megan Hunt, a white state senator, lamented that the decision not to charge Gardner would embolden other white supremacists like him. White supremacist groups, including ones Jake Gardner was in communication with, she wrote, rely on you thinking that none of this is a big deal so they can organize their support. It has become common for everyday people to insert themselves into contentious criminal cases and local issues over the last decade. There have been benefits, videos shot, on smartphones by bystanders to police killings have brought some real accountability. But there's also a danger in regular people taking on the role of freelance investigators or self-deputized prosecutors and spreading misinformation in the process. Sometimes these people, driven by a sense of righteousness or maybe a hunger for a hero's turn, don't have much taste for nuanced tragedy. A few days after the shooting, the white prosecutor gave way to community pressure. A special prosecutor was appointed to re-examine the case. The newly named prosecutor was Fred Franklin, a black former federal prosecutor who had spent his career in Omaha. Months later, a grand jury returned a manslaughter indictment. In the following days, Franklin, with no meaningful evidence, asserted that Gardner had wanted to ambush looters possibly frustrated that he hadn't been able to shoot anyone coming into his bar, Franklin theorized, he went after Skurlock. Gardner was the first aggressor in the episode and thus he could not claim self-defense. Franklin's portrayal of the case found support among many in Omaha's black community who felt he delivered justice at last. The Gardner family was livid. 
Klein, the white prosecutor, said he thought that Franklin had pushed an agenda before the grand jury, facts be damned. Gardner had fled Omaha for his own safety just days after he'd shot Scurlock. He bunked for months with a Marine buddy in Portland, Oregon. Once indicted, he worried he would not survive prison, even for a day. The costs for lawyers would bankrupt his family, he worried. On the morning, he was to board a flight to surrender in Omaha. He shot himself dead, blood from the wound to his head, staining his old US Marine Corps sweatshirt. Two sons of Omaha, dead by the same hand before they were 40. Even with Gardner's death, Omaha did not go quiet. Conspiracy theories were floated that he was still alive and under the protection of white supremacists. A local church denied the Gardner family a funeral for their lost son. The pastor afraid his church would be burned to the ground. Nebraska Democrats censured Klein for abetting white supremacy, and in response, Klein quit his own party, the party of JFK his mother had worshiped. Tucker Carlson and Ann Coulter, for their part, jumped into the news cycle and suggested that a leftist mob, Biden voters, was to be blamed for Gardner's suicide. It turned out Gardner had left something for the world before his suicide. A quotation. It was a saying from the black boxer Reuben Hurricane Carter, who had been wrongly convicted of murder in 1967. This is the quote. To live in a world where truth matters and justice, however late, really happens, that world would be heaven enough for us all. I would wind up spending two and a half years examining the deaths of Scurlock and Gardner. I'd gone to Omaha because I was drawn to heartbreak and I found a world of that. And I'd gone wondering about the nature of tragedy in America and found no shortage of the ills that afflict the country. A mistrust in the fairness and integrity of our criminal justice system, the lasting harm shouldered by the men and women who fight our wars, the menace of misinformation, and a consuming and destabilizing anger that could see Jake Gardner call the Black Lives Matter movement a terrorist organization, and James Scurlock vandalize the businesses of his own hometown. But it might have been the suspicion and fear the people of Omaha felt that registered as most truly tragic. Fear of one another, fear that the truth of what happened might be more complex than they suspected, fear of simply being honest in public. One witness to Skurlock's killing accused me of trying to gaslight him when I wanted simply to double check his account. Another wouldn't talk to me at all unless I stipulated up front that Gardner was a racist. Yet another would not talk to a white male reporter. Marines who had seen combat on behalf of their country and who had fought alongside Gardner did not want their friendship made public and worried that their families would be harmed. The legal director of the ACLU was let go in part because he told his staff he thought Klein's legal assessment of the case for self-defense might actually be sound. A close family friend of the Skurlocks said she was fired from her job at a nursing home after other staffers said the memorial pinned for James she wore would upset the patients. It was a black former Marine who captured that tragedy of Omaha most powerfully. He had served with Gardner, gone to his bar, appeared on a news segment with him to talk about their shared service. Gardner, he said, had treated him like a brother throughout. The black man in me wonders what the hell Jake was doing with a gun out there that night, he told me. But the Marine in me is open to the idea that I might have done the same thing Jake did in firing that gun. It felt complicated, but candid, conflicted, but genuine. It felt empathetic and true. Yet the Marine told me he would not be named. He said he might lose his job if he were. He told me he was sorry, but felt he was without a choice. 
with a sadness hard to measure, I said I understood. Thank you for that, um, Joe. T talk a little bit um, about this dynamic where this lawyer named Ryan Wilkins uh, bursts into, and I mean, basically inserts himself into the story and drives, drives the story to a great extent with a lot of information that is just apparently just made up. I mean, you've, you've dealt with the guy and he sounds like a complicated but, uh, but, but malevolent figure. Well, I actually don't think he's malevolent, which is, I think, part of the problem. Um, the, um, I do find him a sort of darkly fascinating guy. Um, so here's his story. So he's a son of Omaha himself, graduates at the top of his class at the University of Nebraska, works for Teach for America, uh, goes to a very good law school, Washington University School of Law, works for one of the biggest white shoe law firms in the country, Kirkland and Ellis, comes back to his hometown in Omaha um, and works in the general counsel's office at the Union Pacific. To me, thoroughly credentialed, smart young guy, some aspects of virtuousness in his you know, service. And yet, in this moment, I think animated chiefly by his own guilt at not having, you know, spoken out in prior instances, or you know, um, he decided this this was his moment. He had gone to high school with Jake Gardner. They had been Facebook friends for years. They were looking forward to their twentieth high school reunion. But this bright, accomplished, and I think well-meaning lawyer meets with a couple of people who claim to be Gardner's family members and he soaks up all these terrible stories about Gardner's family's racist past, whatever, and he takes to the internet. Um, and, uh, you know, and revels in it. Can't wait to boast um, about how many you know followers he had or how widely his Facebook post was shared. Um, when Gardner is eventually indicted, he, he writes yet another post saying that he was out with his kids picking pumpkins at the time of the announcement and he dropped to his knees in gratitude and satisfaction at the indictment. So I called him. Um, he, had, uh, he was the original person who had written to ProPublica, which prompted the editor-in-chief to give me a call about a white supremacist who had killed a young black so, kid. So he, he's not just uh, uh, making posts and tweeting to people in Omaha. He's reaching out to an investigative organization in New York to, trying to draw attention to all of this. Multiple news organizations. And when he heard that I was eventually you know, out there and was affiliated with ProPublica at the time, he wrote to me and said that he had served as a kind of informal advisor to the special prosecutor, and he had helped put people before the grand jury. So I, he was happy to talk, and we got on the phone, and it was probably about a 45-minute conversation, and literally when I hung up, I called some other reporters at ProPublica, and I was like, I've just had the most breathtaking interview I think I've ever had as a journalist. Um, I said, Ryan, I, I just want to want you to walk me through what you did to sort of verify all of these claims you made about the family. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently not much. Uh, and, and, right, this is a guy who worked for Kirkland and Ellis. Right? You're an attorney, and, right? right? You're you're supposed to. And I, he, I said, well, I looked up the prison records, right? His, his dad never served time in in Texas. Oh, I I, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> um, I said, you know, I talked to both the Southern Poverty Law Center and the uh, Anti Defamation League, you know, and to the you know who have spent decades studying white supremacy and you know, and I said, 
you know, did you ever think to call them with your theorizing about these, you know, Nazi symbols in, in Gardner's Bar's logo or whatever? Well, I, no, I, I didn't think I could do that. Um, at one point he said, um, I'm not comfortable with the direction this interview is taking. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, because the direction is kind of towards truth. Right. Um, right. And, you know, to me, you know, and I gave him every opportunity to talk later, and I sent him, you know, I, I ultimately got Gardner's autopsy from after his death, and it lists every body marking he has on him. He had a bunch of tattoos, a bunch no of strange tattoos. Figures. He's yeah. a big fan of the Lost TV show, and there's, I guess there's some numerical code in Lost that, you know, real fans, that, but he did not have a swastika. Um, and I would send this stuff to Wilkins, and he would just stay silent. No retraction. Uh, no. And, you know, to this day, having had his, you know, literally libelous allegations disproved, he's never copped to it. He's never owned it. Um, and in this world, right, where, uh, you know, in a lawyer of some accomplishment and intelligence can blow through every personal and professional check that you would have to just start posting shit on the internet mm. there is no accountability the one thing that i am proud one mm. of the things i'm proud about in the book is that with the help of a really smart and great sort of social media forensic investigator i was able to to take every person who had either reposted or posted claims that Gardner was a white supremacist or a fascist, whatever, identify them from their user handles, whatever, and I called them all and said, what did you base that on? Ah, no, my friends told me something, or I read it somewhere else, or, um, and I put their names in the book. Good. Oh. Good. Well, now... That it's, I wanted to call attention to it because it's a dynamic that we have to deal with uh, everywhere in a lot of different uh, areas. Would those posts by Ryan Wilkins, this imaginary libelous stuff, would it have taken root if there was a more sort of robust local news infrastructure? Well, look, they, they certainly have the power to, you know, to create harm uh, and menace, you know, even in a city like New York. I mean, not to be, get too distracted, but in a really extraordinary and sad coincidence, right? The book was published May 9th, and literally the week before that, there's a mentally ill African-American young man on a subway train. Jordan Neely. Who, you know, is or isn't menacing other riders on the thing, is or isn't a threat, and he's ultimately tackled and choked out by a former white Marine. Right. And right around that, you know, some of the same things happened in terms of, you know, either false or unproven allegations, whatever. He winds up, like Gardner, charged with manslaughter. Um, anyway, the, the, the chances of such an ugly coincidence are extraordinary, but even in a media environment as robust and, and, um, and rich and competitive as New York, it can still happen. But I do think that the opportunity to write this book was in many ways shaped by the phenomenon that has taken place across the country, which is you know, the eradication basically of local news organizations, or if not their outright eradication, their, you know, evisceration to... So, you know, like I said, Omaha, beyond, beyond its, you know, uh, African-American press, you know, was a, was a great newspaper town. And then the Omaha World Herald was a big deal. Um, they won Pulitzer Prizes back in the day. Um, there's literally almost nothing left. Well, the, the, and so, right, and so I, while I would like to take credit for, you know, a, a feat of great reporting in this book, most of what I did is what would have happened had there been those kinds of news organizations, right? They, they would have found out some of the things I did 
and it's through no great intrepidness or skill on my part. It's just that somebody took the time to do well, it. Well, no, you can don't sell yourself short here. I mean, the 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 book is structured in a lot of ways as sort of a who done it, where you're talking about. So then I call this person and I call that person, and it and it and it's it's wonderful to that extent because it shows you how much work is involved, right? I mean, like, you know, one one lead. Uh, will take you to five other people, and you have to call all five. You don't call four of them. You don't call three of them. You know, um, and, and as you're going through it, one of the things that stands out actually is that um, the Gardner family and the Spurlock family—they both know you're talking to the other, right? I mean, they're literal adversaries. Blood has been spilled. These young men are dead, uh, but they never stop talking to you. And and more than that, they didn't ask you to divulge what you were learning from their adversaries. Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a tribute to them. Um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the humbling experiences of this, among many humbling experiences, I did make it to 100,000 words. Actually, I, I turned it 117,000, and I turned <laughs> it in four months early. So once a sports writer, always a sports writer. You can make your deadline uh, and, and overwrite. Um, but the... Um, uh, and, you know, I've said in, in a variety of forums, right, I, I'd love people to buy the book. I'd love people to take something from the book. Um, the, uh, I'd love for it to sell well. Um, but um, I don't care how many books sell. Both those families read the book and blessed the book. So those are the only two sales I care about. Actually, I gave them the book. <laughs> Um, the, um, and, um, you know, it's a testament to, um, you know, I, I lament in the little presentation I just did about, you know, how, what happened back in 2009 with the, the, the death of Omar Edwards, you know, how people hadn't found a way to sort of see each other and, and, uh, find some kind of peace, whatever. I don't think the Gardner and Skurlock families will ever meet. Um, the, um, I don't think they will ever find a way to fully forgive the other, but I do think they each in, in, uh, cooperating with me found a shared purpose and they each wanted nothing so much as to have the fuller truth of their sons told. Um, and neither pretended either of their boys were good, perfect, um, you know, they were certainly capable of both good and, and capable of terrible mistakes, um, but they were not what they had been reduced to. Um, and so I will say, had there been a local press, right, the two things that I found um, in doing the reporting that that you would have expected to appear if there were, you know, um, an aggressive and, and talented local uh, reporting uh, resources. So I, James Skurlock, right, had been reduced to this by many to, well, he's a, you know, he's a fucking thug, you know, he got what he did. Look, he's, he was locked up uh, when he was 16. So I got his complete sort of criminal history. He's first arrested at age 11. He's living in a homeless shelter in Norfolk, Nebraska with his mom and five of his siblings. He walks into a home in the neighborhood and takes a PlayStation game. He's an 11-year-old boy stealing a toy. He's turned in by a nine-year-old girl next door. He actually pleads guilty to burglary. Um, he's put on probation at age 11. He's not put into any kind, he's not given any kind of resources, whatever. So when he is arrested at 16, for a substantially more problematic and, and dangerous case. He comes before a judge in Norfolk, and there's the option to try him as a 
juvenile or as an adult. And the judge says, well, you know, you should be tried as an adult. You, you have a prior. The prior was the theft of a toy. So that, I think, would be something that, you know, the Omaha World Herald in a, in a different day and age would have found out. On the Gardner side of things, so Gardner is um, uh, in one of the first units to invade Iraq in 2003. And I think, um, you know, he and the other Marines there, you know, they pretty much sweep through uh, to, you know, Baghdad and then to Crete. I think it's the deepest, fastest incursion behind enemy lines in the history of the Marine Corps. But there was a terribly bloody battle at the Battle of Nasiriya, where Gardner uh, fought, and um, I think it was the single worst casualty uh, count for Americans in the Iraq War. Um, and um, but he comes through that. Um, he emerges with two or three traumatic brain injuries from his service, and then he does a peacekeeping mission to Haiti. Um, and upon his return and his ultimate discharge, he's out for a drink in a bar outside Camp Lejeune. He gets jumped outside the bar, probably had too much to drink himself. He is put on the ground and curb stomped. It's not a term I was altogether familiar with, but your mouth and face are put up against a curb and you get stepped on the back of your head. He lost 12 teeth, had his jaw broken in both places. So when he is taken to the ground outside his bar in the middle of a riot in Omaha, it might be worth knowing that he'd been there before and nearly paid with his life. Um, and that just never got reported. Put, put yourself back in your chair as Metro editor. Um, you know, you need content. Uh, the deadlines are unforgiving. What, what do you say if, to a reporter who comes to you and says, I want to do a deep dive into this. I want to do a Doe Sexton type. You know, I want to I get all of the pieces. I want to find out why the good guys aren't that good and the bad guys aren't so bad. Uh, what are the sort of professional and logistical and financial constraints? Well, I mean, they can be many. One, you, you know, you can be Metropolitan Editor of the New York Times and, you know, you ain't worth shit unless you have pretty great reporters. And one of them sitting right in front of us here, Serge Kovaleski, who did the reporting, some of the reporting on the 2009 uh, shooting of Omar Edwards. Um, so, you know, and that kind of talent, um, That kind of talent is um, uh, expensive, or can be. Um, time is expensive, um, but uh, you know if you have the wherewithal and the willingness to, you know, expend uh, expensive time and uh, deploy talented reporters, um, you know, you can get at the facts of things. For me, if you're talking to a young reporter, I guess I would say three things coming out of my experience in doing this book. And maybe they're obvious, and maybe they teach them at Columbia J School, where I never went, and um, is, right, one, mistrust initial accounts of almost anything. Um, you know, uh, sometimes initial accounts are right, sometimes they get part of it right, but not a lot, and not often. Two, have your first instinct be not to blame, but to understand. And it seems fairly straightforward, and you would hope that we're, you know, but even for reporters or whatever, right, um, we know what makes the best story. Um, the uh, work captivated and, and animated by the idea that, you know, 
there's there's got to be a good versus bad storyline here. It makes for the best story. So we're vulnerable to, to that too. Um, but if you can resist the temptation, and God knows it's you know particularly if you are from a community that has suffered you know historical harm over centuries, you know if you can resist the temptation to blame and make the effort to understand, I think that's it. And third, finally, you know, um, and this happened a lot for, you know, uh, whether I was a reporter at the Times or an edit editor at the Times or at ProPublica, you know, police shootings, you know, you go back to 1984, um, you know, in the city sun, right? They're an ugly, um, disfiguring uh, reality of American life. Um, a lot of the police killings are awful. They're tantamount to murder. More and more of them are being prosecuted that way. But not all. And not by a lot. And so I think there is a requirement that in any case, a police shooting, a death in Omaha, you must not allow yourself to sort of, you know, allow those particulars to be swept up in a larger historical, um, you know, phenomenon, right? Both can be true at once. One, whether it's police killing, whatever, can be a scourge that needs to be, you know, eliminated and people held to account. But every single one of those police shootings deserves your willingness to actually figure out as best you can what happened, what motivations might have been at work. Um, and what, you know, for whatever good that is for society, you owe it to the two people involved to get it right. That is where your greatest obligation is. Um, and, you know, um, and to this day, you know, I mean, I go to bed quite anxious all the time about whether I got it right in this. And, you know, I, I can foresee a day in which somebody produces some evidence that demonstrates I didn't. Um, you know, uh, you need to stay humble in this trade. Okay. He stays humble and you show your work. So if people want to go back and, and check it, you, you've got a, a really solid account in this case. Uh, let's open it up uh, for those who would uh, like to uh, ask a question of Joe Sexton, observation. I know some of you have uh, done work in this area. Well, while we're waiting, I will continue. Um, what 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 are you doing now? You're you're on. Yeah, I have a couple of other little things here. Yeah. So, um, I just got this literally the other day, um, and it's an email from somebody in Omaha, and they had read the book. It turns out the person was blind, and it's part of a book club where people come in, and will read the books to folks. Um, and so he sent me an email. And it makes me both sad and in some ways tickled. So it, it, you're going to love this guy. He writes, I was going to interview you about The Lost Sons of Omaha. It's one of the best nonfiction books I've read in probably the past 20 years. Then I realized, what's the point? The book is well-researched, even-handed, and thought-provoking. It has all the things in it that make a great book. It has heart, brains, and soul. There are many tragic figures in the book for whom one might shed tears. The great irony is the most tragic figure of all is the author. <laughs> <laughs> How many interviews have you done for the book? How many media outlets like Fox News, MSNBC, Newsmax, or NPR who wear their bias on their sleeve have bothered to take a deep dive with you over the contents of the story? How many interviewers whom you have spoken to haven't cherry-picked the facts of the book to shape their own narratives? 
You know, I didn't even know this book existed until one of our volunteer narrators brought the book to me and asked if he could read it. I was stoked. I remember thinking during the sad events of 2020 that someone should write a book about it. So it came to pass. You would think that the guy who read it for us, who himself served in the military, would have empathy, if not sympathy, for Jake Gardner. Nope. He was quick to pin the blame on Gardner and Don Klein for the events of May 30th and their subsequent, and their, and their subsequent aftermath. Our executive director, herself a committed progressive, refuses to read the book because she is already bound to a certain narrative. I suspect she would find the entirety of the book too uncomfortable. I'm sure there are just as many people on the right who are also bound to their stories about James Scurlock. So nice job, Joe, nice job. You have the dubious honor of writing a book that everyone needs to read and, no one, and almost no one wants to read. <laughs> I'm sure close friends and professional associates have already rendered you many a pat on the back and given you the prerequisite, attaboy, Joe, too little, too late. <laughs> By the time your book is properly understood, some kindly librarian will be leading a book club somewhere in the underground civilization that serves as the remnants of the next global nuclear war. It will be gloomy. This all could have been avoided if only kind of book club discussion fraught with tears and post-trauma and dehydrated ice cream. <laughs> he gets you. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. Uh. It was by far and away the best review the book has gotten. Yeah, that, that's good. It's hard to top that. Well, so what, what are you? Are you are you back at ProPublica? Are you pretending to be retired? What are you doing there? Well, the uh, <laughs> uh, no, I'm uh, I, I'm charting a new life at at 64 as a as a freelancer. Uh, the uh, and finding it quite anxiety producing. Um, the uh, no, uh, um, I've, I'm making a film with HBO, a true crime documentary that'll air in 2024. Um, I just wrote a piece. There's a great, you know, once you get really dispirited about the state of local news in America. So Beth, my wife, and I and our twin girls moved up to Vermont at the start of the pandemic. We've been up there three years now. I've gotten to know some of the, uh, you know, media players in Vermont. And there's this completely absurd um, uh, anachronism of a alt-weekly in Burlington <laughs> called Seven Days. It is given away for free, like back in the day with the Village Voice, whatever. It supports a 40-person newsroom on print advertising. Whoa. Including Whoa. classifieds. Wow. Um, and it's a really impressive group of people. They've been doing it for you know 30 years now, 35 years. Um, and so I, you know, I met them, and I was charmed by the woman who's the publisher. Um, and so I just did a story for them. Uh, it won't shock people here who know me at all that it's the longest story they've ever published. Um, <laughs> it's a 15,000 word story about um, the tragedy of the one juvenile lockup in Vermont. Vermont um, is an interesting place. Um, it has a, a sort of sense of its own exceptionalism. And for outsiders, you can, you know, it's a you know the state of Bernie Sanders and I don't know fucking oatmeal Howard or Dean. whatever you know. It's, um, I mean, it's like the size of Staten Island, right? It's like six hundred thousand people. Six hundred thousand people. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The um, but it has some really dark corners. Hmm. Um, and uh, <laughs> so naturally, you went to find them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm now going to do a story for the for the Marshall Project. Um, and um, but if, and there's a, I have found a really great um, old dive bar in Burlington, Vermont, called the Old North Ender. Um, and uh, I went in one night with Beth, and we were having a drink, whatever, and they had a little sign up saying they were looking for a daytime bartender. Uh, <laughs> for all the day one, one I was One, I was attracted to, the, you know, the <laughs> idea of tending bar, whatever. I always kind of wanted to do it. But two, to be the daytime guy. They open at eight. Um, <laughs> I'm like, these are my fucking people. Um, 
<laughs> so I could, you, if you come to Burlington, you could see me behind the bar. But do you remember, right, in Brooklyn, right, Farrell's Bar and Farrell's, Grill, sure. in, I would get up when we were, you know, back in the day, because uh, I lived on uh, 16th Street, whatever. I come by, you could look in Farrell's at 8 a.m., and Tom Cute, I don't know if the name rings a bell, the former city council speaker, whatever, he'd be drinking at 8 a.m. in Farrell's. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah. Hold up. I will speak to the mic. Is it on? I can hear you, Timmy. Okay. So, I, just to go back to the local news and a little bit more broadly on reporting generally. So, as Joe knows, my brother's a TV investigative reporter in Pittsburgh. Um, been there for years. His stories come from his sources. Uh, he's about your age, Joe, and and the station wants him to train the younger people. He said, "There's not. I have nothing to tell them. They don't do what I do. They don't have sources. They follow the internet. They pick up a national story and look for a local angle. So, so would." Is reporting today going to? The reporters themselves are on Twitter. Are they going to? Are they the ones that are going to counter the misinformation on the internet anymore? Because I don't know that they do what you do. Well, I, I hold a different opinion than than Andrew. The uh, I, I I would never get a job in journalism today, um, coming out of college with what I had to offer. Uh, my experience over the last, you know, 10 years since I left the Times or whatever, I, I, the, the young people who are coming up and finding their way into journalism are much more capable than I ever was, can speak multiple languages, are digital savvy, um, you know, can do a podcast one day and write a straight news story the next. Um, you know, they are often deeply committed. They are, I have found by and large women um, and I have no lack of faith in the capabilities of young people and young reporters. Um, and, you know, there's no great art to developing sources. It's about staying in the same place for a while, long enough to make them. Um, and, you know, that can be challenging, whatever. But I, I, am, I am thoroughly optimistic about it. I, I, would, I would only add to that um, that it, it may take some seasoning, and that's just a function of time. I mean, for sure... The kids that I teach at the uh, Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, um, naming rights, you know, um, they, they, they are powerhouses. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like they, you know, like I, I, I never took a journalism class. You never took a journalism class. We just kind of learned it out here on Geralman and Court Street. They, I mean, I'm, I'm, I do my very best every year to try and tell them all of the things I wish I'd known. You know, like I learned court reporting, they said, go, go to Brooklyn Criminal Court and come back with a story. And if you can't find a story in Brooklyn Criminal Court, you'll never be a reporter, uh, which turned out to be true. So you go in there and it's, it's a madhouse. You don't know what's going on. You know, pe young people are being dragged around in chains and there's bedlam and people are telling jokes and, you know, and you have to start asking people, what the hell's going on here? And that's journalism. What the hell is going on here? So, you know, we sort of reproduce that with the young people. But then when it comes to sources, I mean, the other thing I tell you, it's, it's, you, it just takes some seasoning. When we started doing political reporting here, you know, um, Tish James was carrying papers for Al Van, one of the local assemblymen that we reported on. Um, Adams was a cop. I knew him because my sister was a cop and was part of his organization. Um, you know, all, all the way down the line, all of these folks who are amazing sources now, are just, you know, and so I, what I tell the, the folks is like every, every person you come across, if they work for a city council member, if they're hugging the wall, faded off in the background, they're going to be somebody. If they stay around long enough, talk to everybody, be nice to everybody, talk to the security guards, they see everything. Talk to the people on the protective detail, they see everything. Talk to the people, you know, I mean, and, and, and just wait. And just wait. And make sure you have enough phone numbers and enough connection with people that when the stuff hits the fan and you need an accurate answer, like today, right now, on a Sunday night, you know who to call. 
uh, and and then you're doing it. You know, it's it's you know yeah, it's, it's yeah. the desire to do it that re you really can't teach. That that part is true. You can't necessarily make people want to do it if they don't want to. But if they want to do it, it's not rocket science. Well, right, and they sort of self declare by you know. I mean, when they sh when they show up in front of you or whatever, they they made their intentions exactly clear. Exactly. Hello. Uh, I like to uh, just blame Errol Lewis for costing my household some money because <laughs> New York One is such a great station for local news that Thank we are you. permanently tethered to to Spectrum. And as, as much as we like to cut bait with that, man, we just can't miss having the coverage. Thanks that you guys very do. much. Thank and you. And it's un unfortunately, it's so much better for the local coverage than the New York Times is, which is now a national paper, and you can barely get anything about Brooklyn or anything local in there, which is unfortunate. Uh, cry me a river, man. The, uh... So you know, we miss you, and we <laughs> bring, bring the old letter to have back. you. Yeah. But uh, just in terms of the national story, I wonder if you think if the same kind of deep dive was done in some of the other national stories related to comparable incidents over the last uh, several years, whether they'd have a similar kind of uh, uncovering it. Yeah, I mean, look, the, um, and look, I am not a, you know, a particularly articulate uh, scholar of, you know, the changing landscape of journalism, whatever, I don't. Um, so, you know, uh, it is undoubtedly true that when there were more newspapers uh, and more news organizations, there was a greater chance that, you know, good work could be done. It was by no means assured. Um, you know, as somebody at ProPublica just recently wrote a, a, a kind of, I thought, wise and timely thing about, it. you know, everyone's lamenting the loss of local news, whatever. And I think we remember, we remember it more fondly than it actually was. You, you know, local news had all sorts of, you know, conflicts of interest and problematic. And anyway, but anyway, when they were more, you know, uh, numerous, there's a greater chance that good work could be done. That said, you know, there's good work being done everywhere, um, you know, and in all kinds of uh, creations. Um, you know, I've spent, but now, sadly, better part of three years out in Topeka, Kansas, uh, for this film for HBO, and um, the uh, and you know the Topeka Capital Journal is you know a shell of what it once was, whatever. But there's a new nonprofit called the Kansas Reflector, or whatever, run by a you know hustling group of young uh, and talented people, or whatever, and they're doing really consequential work. Um, I will say this about Topeka and Omaha. Having spent a lot of time in Topeka and now a lot of time in Omaha, to go from Topeka to Omaha is to go to fucking Paris. Uh, the, <laughs> you do not want to spend time in Topeka. Uh, <laughs> Omaha, you know, you can, I mean, Omaha, I, I, you know, it really is a, got a fascinating history. It's got, you know, old mob, boss, you know, political barons back in the day. There was a time in Omaha's history when uh, it had a greater African-American population than any city west of the Mississippi other than Los Angeles. Um, you know, athletic royalty, Gail Sayers, Bob Gibson. Um, I mean, the, uh, and now Terrence Crawford is probably the best pound for pound fighter in the world. Um, you know, Father Flanagan, Boys Town is Omaha. Warren Buffett is Omaha. Uh, there was a time in which Omaha, I never, this is probably one of these stats that wouldn't hold up to actual fact checking, but I'm charmed by it anyway. But that Omaha at one point per capita had more billionaires than any city in America. Hmm. Um, and the tragedy of, of North Omaha, which is the black community in uh, the city, is that it's just not that big a population right? It's a conquerable problem in a city with as many resources and as much money as Omaha, um, you know, and yet it endures. Um, and that's where James Skirlock grew up. Okay, you know what, I think that brings us to the end of our time, but let's get, yeah, let's. So, so I had the, uh, the great fortune for six years working for uh, Joe at the Times and uh, always marveled at his ability to uh, come up with great ideas. 
yeah, essentially seeing things other people weren't seeing. So one thing I was curious about is if you could tell us a little more about how you decided on this as a, a book topic and um, in your mind what it crystallizes for you about America today. Um, I know that's a wide open question, but what, what does it capture about America? Well, so right, so it begins with this kind of frantic call from the editor in chief who has this pedestrian concern about, you know, a hole in the Tuesday publishing schedule. Um, but I, you know, I was able to Google around enough to find out, right? There was video available of some of what took place outside Gardner's bar that night. Um, and there was audio, whatever. And so it was clear immediately to me that whatever happened was a lot more complicated than what I was being sold on. Um, and then I, I followed it, right? Just sort of, you know, passively, whatever, but with some attention. And extraordinary things happen, right? When the special prosecutor is appointed and he's a black man, I was like, okay, that could be really good or really bad. Um, and it doesn't happen often. Um, and then, you know, when Gardner is indicted, I was like, okay, I've, you know, covered a fair amount of criminal justice over the years. Um, that shocked me, given what I had known as the, you know, understood and accepted facts of what had happened. Um, and then when he kills himself and somebody sent me the headline, I was like, okay, I've, I'm enough of a judge of a story like I got to figure out what the fuck happened. Um, cause that, that shook me. Um, and not necessarily out of sympathy or whatever, but just like, wow, there's some powerful human drama going on with a, you know, a real underlying set of, you know, complicating and maybe interesting facts. Um, the, um, it, you know, the experience of reporting it was pretty dispiriting. Um, the, uh, I, you, you're out there every day doing it and others here in this room, you know, I have one of my many kind of glib sayings, whatever is that, you know, reporting is never meant to be easy, whether you're in Cincinnati or in Syria or whatever. But it was just, it felt, and maybe it's just because I hadn't been out in the world reporting for a while. Uh, take a couple of you know decades off and then get get back in the saddle or whatever. But I, it felt different, you know. It just felt like people were so um, right. I mean, it, it's always been tough, you know. There are always going to be people who want to tell their version of the story or this. But it felt angry and um, entrenched and uninterested in actual illumination and you know it was pretty sad but you know there's hope so can we end on a note of hope yeah let's do All that right. those who know me know it can't be an actual event if there's not a poem um, and it's a poem that has been uh, aggrandized and cannibalized by politicians over the last number of years. Uh, Bill Clinton was first to, uh, to sort of claim it for his purposes. Biden used portions of it for a campaign ad in, in 2020. Um, but we can't let the politicians win is what I say. Um, so it's a poem that, you know, for all of the dispiriting, you know, experiences of it, for all the sadness of the book, um, you know, despair doesn't feel, feel like a particularly courageous answer to it all. So, human beings suffer. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. 
the police widow in veils faints at the funeral home. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope in history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracle and cures and healing wells. Call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its term. Thank you so much for coming.